Patch Iranian Show. Thank you for joining us on 11-11-11 Veterans Day. It's a special day and I hope that we all take a few minutes and stand still and remember our freedom and those that fought for us. It certainly has been very touching some of the tributes that I've watched on television and heard over radio and we do appreciate that so much. I have a guest that's on her way and uh, not sure she's going to make it but uh, we'll go forth anyway. Uh, we're going to be talking about Keith uh, Terry's book, Sophia, which has hit big time, and we're very excited about that. So if she gets here, great. If not, I want to tell you about a couple of things. I want to talk about Kayani, of course, which is my major sponsor. And my number to get hold of me and find out about Kayani or about being on the radio with me, or if you're interested in running ads or being a sponsor, uh, if you've got something you want to talk about or you want us to talk about, or if you'd like to share something that's going on in Utah County, that we can advertise, we'll be happy to do that. We're starting to gather information about what's happening in Utah County. The, uh, de the Department of, what are they, Tourism and something else, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, they're really busy and said they can't come and help right now. So if you've got information that we should have, send it forth in our chat room, tell us about what's going on. If you're on pat.utahvalleylive.com, the chat room is right there. Send us a note. Let us know what you've got going on for the public that we can be involved in. I do know that there's a boutique going on this afternoon, in fact, all day today, down in Spanish Fork. It's not at the fairgrounds. It's at another place large enough to hold boutiques, and I can't remember what that is because I wasn't planning on giving this information out. But I'm going to head down there this afternoon and see what's going on. It sounds like it's going to be fun. But let me talk a second about Kayani. There are three products with this company, kyani.net, if you'd like to look it up. And uh, been very, very grateful for finding this company. I had thought I'd had enough of network marketing and every juice on the planet, and I certainly didn't want another one. Nothing had worked. I'd spent a lot of money over the years and been CEO of a number of companies that had products. Well, as it turns out, July 10, I was introduced to products that have changed my life. I'd been diabetic, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, crippling arthritis, um, just a mess, tired all the time. And I got involved in these products, and voila, within a month, I was feeling so much better. And completely off of all medications, did not have to, have not had any medications, seen the doctors a couple of times in between, perfect, 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 perfect. I could not even close my fist any way, shape, or form. And um, now I can. I can make a fist, both hands, and before I couldn't. Arthritis pain is gone. So I'm very excited about these products because truly they are changing not just my life, but a number of people's lives have been changed. The energy from the products, there's a Sunrise, which is a bottle full of minerals and vitamins and uh, uh, super fruits, but mostly the um, blueberries from the Alaskan tundra. They're absolutely huge and wonderful and full of antioxidants, and that's why they're so good for you. Also, there's a Sunset, which is Omega-3, uh, which is pure fish oil, no mercury and no fish parts, pure oil. And then there's a Nitro FX, which triggers our body to create the nitro oxide, which we need in order to have energy, and we stop develop making that, creating that in our bodies in our 30s. It gets less and less and less and less. So if you find yourself wanting to take a nap, and then you want to take two naps, and then you don't want to get out of bed, we can reverse all of that. So call me on 801-362-9552. 801-362-9552. We'll talk about it and see what we can do for you. OK, I want to mention some folks that are coming on with me on Monday. Um, Roger Strong, he's got a new newspaper out. It's about six months old. And uh, they kind of regrouped and restarted. And uh, just recently, it's back out on the stands. I want you to look for it. It's tidbits. Lots and lots of information about what's happening in Utah County, particularly along I-15 from top to bottom, south to north, north to south. And uh, you'll meet him on Monday. He's going to tell you about this. And um, we'll find out more about the paper. I've got it spread out because I really find it interesting. And I imagine somebody starting a paper at this point, and it's very successful already. So if you haven't been approached about ads, you're going to be. So he's out selling ads. I'm out selling ads. We're going to see how we can help each other. I think that my guest has arrived, so let's uh, welcome her in. Sally Johnson, if you're here, come on in. Good to have you with us. Good to be here, Pat. I assume you got hung up 
with a yellow cone somewhere. Well, yes, we had about a 10 minute dead stop on University Parkway. Okay, I'm gonna and, ask you to pull uh, just a little bit towards me uh -huh, and do. get right up to the microphone. There we go. Yeah, good. <laughs> and Sally and I've met somewhere, but I can't remember where. Do you remember where it was? I do, and I'm embarrassed to admit that it was about 45 years ago. <laughs> I wasn't born then. How can that possibly be? She was a mere child. <laughs> well, maybe only 42 years ago. <laughs> Must but, have been in uh, California. We were in Southern California, and I was going to a group called Associated Latter-day Media Artists that was oh, started by right. Robert right. Starling, I believe, and Donna right. Conkling, and some of those All the people. King sisters were Al involved. Lampkin. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were all involved. Yeah, so we, I was there, and I was a mere teenager with uh, a young man that I was dating at the time and you were one of the movers and shakers of the group <laughs> as I remembered and I met your son Mark right and uh, we subsequently this is did one a number of his of younger things. brothers that just welcomed you oh yeah, wonderful this is, yeah this is Kent you <laughs> so. had tall sons I have very tall I mean, Mark is almost six <laughs> nine and uh, actually Kent's the smallest my second son he's just under six three and then I have one six six and six four they had to behave. I climbed stairs and stand over them. <laughs> so somebody said you put them all on a rack when they were little and stretch them out. And I said, yes, they had to behave. Well, they turned out pretty good. Well, thank you. They have turned out good. Um, you were involved. Were you in modeling then or were you involved in what were you involved in that you were there? Because did you not do some modeling for me at some time or another? Uh, back I then? never did any modeling. What I did was um, I was a wannabe, actually. So all of you people that uh, want to be something rich and famous someday, like I did when I was a teenager, uh, just start out and get to know Pat, and she'll <laughs> she'll lead you right. We're putting so. it back. In, uh, can you imagine after all those years, I am on a camera and on the radio at the same time again. Those were fun days in Southern California because you know what? The Mormon community was just beginning to make the breakthrough. Uh, we had a few people that were consistently... Uh, making commercials, and I made so many commercials that after a while you stopped looking for jobs to, um, to be. I was in a couple of films. I think the first one was Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman. Now, you haven't lived until your first shot in the makeup room that's sitting next to you is <laughs> Joanne Woodward, and uh, it was really fun being in makeup with them. We had a lot of fun. Oh, that's and exciting. And I, I learned nothing. I just tried to keep my mouth shut and stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it was a fun time to be in California and in Southern California at the time. Did you wind up doing any acting? I did little little things here and there, and uh, nothing really to speak of. I ended up getting married. I met the man of my dreams, and uh, proceeded to have four children in five years. So that kind of put a crimp in my. I did uh, the same thing. <laughs> the baby was three months old, and my oldest one was four and a half. Oh, uh, yes. I had four in there, so yeah, that, uh, busy. It, it keeps you very busy, and that we was We learn how to run at, an er <laughs> at, a, at a different age than high school. Well, that was the right thing to do at the time, and I'm glad that things turned out that way. And now my baby is 23 years old, and I decided it's time for me to have the season of my career. So I'm All right, now well, let's, doing those let's things. Let's talk about your career, because... I had remembered your name from somewhere, and now that I see you, of course I remember you. She is a beauty, and she has always been. You look at this gorgeous skin. <laughs> My goodness, she's gorgeous. Um, but um, let's, let's find out where you, what you're doing right now, because I met Keith Terry and his wife in Newport Beach when they were living there. He was writing, but he's hit the big time with these books, and we're excited about it. So let's start out by finding out who you are and how you got to Keith's front door. That's kind of an interesting story. My mother and father work in the Newport Beach Temple, and one day they were seated around the lunch table with Keith and a number of other people, and Keith was telling a few stories and mentioned that he was an author, and my mother was instantly intrigued and said, could you ever use a proofreader? And Keith said, I'm always looking every, for a good proofreader. Every author is looking for a proofreader. <laughs> so my mother said, my daughter is really wonderful with that type of thing. Would you please t um, get take a, a moment, t give her a call, and see if she'd have some time to take a look at your latest manuscript? So he did, and I did, and we, we instantly clicked because Keith is somebody with a great deal of talent in the writing department, 
but he's not too good with spelling, if I may say that publicly. <laughs> well, because you don't take time. The thoughts come. This is my excuse in high school. They, they just they get a rush of, of information when you're writing. And so you just write it. I mean, we start out longhand, and then you don't learn to spell because now you have a computer and you don't have to. So, I've worked with a number of authors, and I have found that the ones that are extremely gifted in the creativity department Can't spell. Tem tend to be the worst spellers. And they're people who don't self-edit frequently. They just let the ideas flow. They spell it any way they want. If they went back and corrected all their spelling errors, then the ideas would be uh, stopped. You do. You stop the flow. be a road bump yeah. in their creativity. <laughs> and we don't want that to happen because some of the most beautiful ideas come from these creative genius people and who just let the ideas flow. And then I go back and just sweep and clean up and, and edit and put things in different order sometimes and can make a more comprehensive picture of what they're trying to say than they can. What, uh, what was your maiden name? My maiden name was Fairbanks. I'm very proud of it. And Is any I, related to any relation to the sculptures? Yes. My grandfather's uncle was the famous Abbott Fairbanks, who really? sculpted a number of the statues on Temple Square. And, Did you know Jonathan? And Jonathan, I believe, is back east. I understand and, he is. Yeah, and very, very prominent in the arts community there. He, he's not someone that would know me personally, but he's someone that I've seen on the family roster. You're in the family tree. You guys are right. in the same family tree. <laughs> well, that's great. You've had a lot of experience, and you've been around the arts, grown up with it in your genes. That's kind of exciting. Well, now, do you just, you're a consultant, you're a literary agent, what would we say? I'm not what I would say a literary agent. Uh, I've worked with two or three other authors before Keith, and uh, but when I came to Keith, his idea was the most fully, fully developed. He brought me a, about a 400-page manuscript with Sophia, and when I read through it and plowed through all of those misspelled words, I saw some very <laughs> beautiful things and a story that I was very interested in starting to take place. And so I told him that I would love to correct all of his spelling errors and grammar and punctuation, that type of thing. And then I said, Keith, if you would permit me, I would love to give you some ideas that I think would enhance the story. And to Keith's credit, he, he said, listened? go for it. Now, that is a no-no. As, yeah, as totally, you <laughs> totally. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling away because a lot of authors have just, you've been fired right there. <laughs> yes, and that's something that I've learned in my classes on, on proofreading since then is never, ever, 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 ever pretend ever. to be a writer <laughs> or tell the writer what to do. Keith is a very humble and accommodating soul, and he said, Sally, I would love to hear your ideas. And so I explained a few things that I thought would help develop the characters a little bit more and added a couple of things that I felt would really, that were in, in harmony with his ideas, but I think he just didn't take them quite far enough. For example, he would say, the burly conductor of the train. And I said, well, let's give him a name. Let's give him some characteristics that we can really see this guy. Burley, we know he's a big guy then. We know he's a train conductor. But let's say, so let's have him do some things that, such as lumbering or let's have him uh, actually do more specific things that will indicate just well, what you, a burly conductor he you is. Identify. If you know enough about them, you can begin to identify. Well, let's show the book. Is this the book that we're talking about this here? This is the book we're talking it's, about. Now it's out in the stores, right? And it is out in the stores. It's being carried wherever. Push it towards the camera a little bit. There wherever uh, LDS books are sold. And it's beautiful. It's offered in hardcover at all the LDS book sellers. You can get it online at latterdaylegends.com. Latterday Legend or Legends, either one will get you there. You can purchase this. You can also order it on Amazon.com, anywhere books are sold. You can get this book, but if you want the nice hardcover version, you'll need to go where the LDS books are sold. It's great. And do you have? Do you remember about what it sells for? Is it what nineteen or twenty-five somewhere in there? I don't know. It says twenty-two fifty okay. on the cover inside. Okay, very good. There may good. be some discounts available though. Okay, um, well, we're um, it's here, and now we're going to hear about it. Now, I've been hearing about this book because people have loved it, and they identify with the heroine. 
that she apparently is quite a, an amazing personality. So I'm ready to hear about this story. I, I, let's see, did I have one other question? Um, we know how you met. Oh, as, as, an, as an author, what sets him apart in your mind from other people as far as this book is concerned? Well, the thing I liked about Keith Terry was that he has actually been in the locations that he's describing. He talks about the Ukraine and uh, the, a train ride between the Ukraine and Vienna, Austria. And it's clear from the way that he describes it that he has actually ridden that train. He talks about the the different cars in the train and the, the way that the seats look and the way they creak and, and different details that only someone that's really been there would be able to add to the story. And the advantage of that is, again, you feel like you're there. And that, that is, a, it's a talent, it's a gift, because if you're not, you're reading about distant people and you don't get involved with them, but if you feel like you're there, you're on the train, you are ex feeling the feelings of the train moving and the whole thing, and he apparently has that. Now, I've read one of Keith's books years ago, one of his first books, and for the life of me, I tried to find it in my bookcase. I don't know where it went, but I can't even remember what it was. But I remember I didn't finish, I didn't just put it down. I read it and finished it all in one. And I understand this book is this compelling. I think it's a page turner. I, I really do. There, there are a number of occurrences that are larger than life. They're all based on true happenings of either Mr. Terry or people that he knew or people that he had researched. And I think that you'll find that the, the realism is there in each of the, the occurrences, the details and the, the smells and the sights and the sounds. And most of the people in the, in the book, most of the characters are fleshed out so that you can really see them and feel them and know what they're trying to accomplish with, with the way that they're described. Uh, tell me who this, I mean, this looks like somebody's portrait, and is this a person, the woman on the cover of this? And again, I'm going to hold this up, and I can't quite tell where the light's hitting it or not, but this is, oops, I'm going to keep the light off of it. Um, let me see if I can get it high enough up for the camera to get it. If you're listening on radio, you're on KHQN, 10, uh, 1480 AM, and the books are available to Desert Books, Seagull, Amazon, anywhere they're selling LDS books, and they can also get them online at LDS Legends. Latterdaylegends.com. Latter Latter okay, Latterdaylegends.com. And uh, it's uh, around $22. So tell me about the girl on the cover now. Very, I very attractive brunette for those of you on radio. And it is, is a portrait beautiful. of someone. She is beautiful. As Keith and I were talking about what the cover should look like, I began to picture, well, actually, I should say that when I was working with the manuscript, I got a picture in my mind of what Sophia looked like. We knew she had dark hair. We knew she had fairly colorful skin and beautiful, beautiful skin with rosy cheeks and dark eyes. And we, uh, I just in my mind, I began to see her. And I actually pictured her looking a little bit like Olivia Hussey. I don't know if you remember that actress. She played uh, Juliet in the Romeo and Juliet oh, film yes. quite beautiful. a few years yeah, ago. And she also played Mary, the Virgin Mary, in uh, a nativity movie, uh, The Life of Christ, or some, I can't remember the title. I didn't see that, that film, but I've seen many pictures of her with the headdress on, similar to a nun's headdress, or looking very biblical, of course, with the, the headpiece. But I just began to see that beautiful, pure, unadorned face, and I began to think, who do I know? Who do I know that looks like Olivia Hussey, only is contemporary and somebody that I might be able to entice to come over and take a and to model for me. Well, I found her in my database because one of my other in my other life, I, I was a film producer, a, a video. I should say a video producer. We I, haven't actually got <laughs> into your background. We need we need to know more about to just raising five children and having parents. So. <laughs> That's important. The most important. Well, I I did some educational videos for a company called International School of Languages, and I interviewed and and collected headshots on a number of of people that I thought might be 
uh, good to bring into this educational video project. Good. And I had this young woman's headshot in my database, and I was I was looking through it. I knew that she was represented by a local talent company called Night Star, and so I called up Tony Knight and said, "Is Tatum still around? I could really uh, use her. I think for a." a photograph that I'm doing. I'd love to see what she looks like. And I need her to p portray a character that's about 17 years old, but to look very fragile and frail and yet intelligent and sensitive. And I just want to capture everything in this face. Do you think Tatum can do it? And he said to me, well, uh, yes, I think Tatum's your girl, but he says, I don't want to tell you how old she is, <laughs> and, and maybe I shouldn't say it on camera. Maybe she wouldn't want it to be known a as an actress, but let me just say she's quite a few years older than 17, and I was a little bit worried when she showed up to my studio and came in the door. I took one look at her, and I was just, all of my fears were groundless because this woman is timeless. She's classic. She could play a 14-year-old. She could play a 25-year-old. She could play a 40-year-old. I've never seen a face that is so What's her last name? Adop adaptable to anything. Um, well, her married last name is Langdon, Okay. Tatum Langdon, and she does acting and modeling. And again, her agency is Night Star. Well, and I know. I've worked with Liz. Right. Yeah, we were all together down at BI. Media. That's right. That's yeah. right. Okay. Did I meet so you down there? Any I chance think, that yes, we ran I into did. each other? I, I stopped into back. your office yeah. one day and I was talking to you right. about that educational yeah. video series. In fact, I was thinking about filming right. segments of it there. Were. Oh my goodness. So we good. crossed paths a couple of years ago, but the Liz does a great job. <laughs> and so is she uh, she came and sat for you and you she came and sat. I have to tell you this is kind of interesting. Uh, my studio that I that sounded so official when I first <laughs> announced it is actually my living room. We we brought in big black sheets and covered all the windows and doors. And my daughter Kaylee is a professional photographer, and so we I got I enlisted my daughter to take this cover photo. We sat her on a very uncomfortable stool in my living room, and Tatum was wonderful. We we got all, every candle that we had in the house, and and my husband and Alicia, who did the layout, and me, and myself, we all gathered around holding these lit candles around Tatum's face oh, to get that just glow. the right glow. <gasps> That's and interesting. We had candle wax dripping on our hands <laughs> and burning us, and and we Kaylee would say, move the candles just a little bit further to the right, a little <laughs> bit further to the left. And uh, the three of us posed her and, and put those candles every which way until we got just the right shot. And Tatum, to her credit, sat there and just glowed herself from an inner glow. I said, you are someone that wants to be a nun. You are someone that is t completely devoted to God and yet firmly grounded on earth. And she got this faraway look in her eyes that was just perfect. And, and you can see the results yeah, on um, this cover. Again, for radio, it has been captured. If you do nothing else, go in the stores and look for Sophia by Keith Terry. Um, which it, it made me re remember something. If you're not uncomfortable when you're being photographed, you're not doing something right. <laughs> I've been, I have, when I was working, honestly, they had us climbing ladders. We'd be sitting in trees and on ledges, and you twist your arms and legs in angles that you think this is going to look terrible, and it turns out. So a lot goes into a photograph, and um, it really is worth looking at all of them. But this is a beautiful photograph of this girl, and I wish her well in her career. And I should uh, tell you that we, this is kind of, can I say anything controversial? Well, yes, certainly. <laughs> we're, we're I think it makes a little bit of, sp of spice in okay. the show, might uh, get your How political listeners. Are you you uh, want to get into political <laughs> things? <here? laughs> I won't mention any names, but um, actually, there's a Christian painter who will remain nameless. He's one of my favorites. He's just absolutely stunning. His paintings are I was getting ready to tell you a story about one, so maybe I better not. Okay. Uh, well, he's, he's a great, great talent. Certainly, I believe his talent comes from the Lord. 
and uh, don't want to disparage him in any way, but we saw one of his paintings that we just fell in love with. The publisher, Boyd Tuttle, of, of uh, Digital Legend and Latter-day Legend. Who was on with uh, me last week, and he'll be on with me a week from Friday. That's that's right. Boyd's wonderful. Yeah. and Two weeks, maybe. And uh, he and I discussed over and over, and Keith Terry and I discussed over and over uh, what we could put on this cover. And after seeing this Christian painter's work, we just fell in love with this beautiful, dark-haired, innocent-looking young woman that he had painted in a, a beautiful setting, and she was candle-lit and uh, had just the right expression and just the right face, and we contacted that painter and asked him if we could use it for our book cover, and we were going to pay him a handsome royalty as well. And he asked what it was for and what the book was about. And I said, it's about a Catholic girl uh, who is um, wanting to become a, a nun someday. And she's very virtuous and goes through a number of trials and comes across the path of the Mormon prophet, Joseph F. Smith. And when that Christian gentleman heard that it was about Catholics and Mormons, he wrote back and said he was not interested in having us use his painting. So he wasn't LDS or he, Catholic He's or very much anti-LDS and anti-Catholic, and uh, he felt that that would be a violation of his integrity to allow the cult Mormons to use his painting <laughs> to promote a book by an LDS author. And I have to respect his integrity. He was true to what he believed in, He's a great talent, and I, I, I don't want to disparage him in any way. I, I feel that he is um, a person of, of great integrity. As I, that's all I need to say is that he felt well, strongly you know, about it, and we didn't want to violate that in any right. way. And, I, I, you know, sometimes things happen because they're supposed to, because this is the right girl. And well, this is the right yes. This we is wanted right to. Now, we did not copy his painting in any way. The only thing that we copied was we lit the girl with candles, as as he had in his painting. Our girl turns out to be, uh, and his girl did not have a headpiece on. She did not have this particular expression. I don't think that he would recognize his painting in any way from what we've done with it. We've actually taken it and made it what I think is more appropriate for this book. Years ago, I had an occasion to work with Greg Olson to meet him. And um, I was arrogant enough to think I was going to come home from my mission, and he had, was, hadn't been heard of yet, really. And I was going to represent him. <coughs> Excuse me. When I came home from the mission, I found him in Provo again, introduced myself, offered to take his beautiful paintings and put them in larger size than postcard, which is all he had. And he paused. We were on the phone. And he, I said, do you remember meeting me? Yes. And I said, well, I'm home. I'm ready to take your stuff to the world, your beautiful paintings to the world. And he said, hmm, it's already been done. And I was, oh, dear, how can that be? Well, while I was on my mission, which was a public affairs mission, and I should have known better, uh, I called my friend Larry Barkdahl, and I said, tell me what's happened with Greg Olson while I've been gone. And I won't give you the amount of money he made that year while I was gone, but it was astronomical because he signed up with the right people that took his work worldwide. And uh, I asked him later when I was in a meeting with him, congratulating him for a picture of, and I've forgotten the name of it, but it's a girl standing in her with robes just whisp, you know, in, bree in the breeze. You can almost see them moving when you look at it. And I said, that is so ethereal. It's so spiritual. And I practically had tears in my eyes over this because it's such a beautiful painting. He said, yeah, we had a lot of problems. So I said to him, is it very spiritual? And he said, by the time you get to it, and they had a, his daughter, who was the model, standing on a ladder with fans on her in the front <laughs> and in the back on a freezing cold day. And they have to first take the pictures and get the image going. And they had a tough time getting the ladder to stand. Leaves kept falling. I mean, by the time you get through whatever spirituality, it's left for the person to view when it's over. But it is interesting to know what people go through to create the covers for their books and their great paintings. And certainly Greg is one of our beloved LDS painters. Yes, uh, and we had hoped mm. that we could have Mr. Olson paint 
a commission a painting by him for this book cover or we had hoped that he would have something he's only booked already. about 10 years ahead <laughs> right i that's what we found out in investigating <coughs> yeah. we we discovered that it's <coughs> not easy to get greatness at your beck and call <laughs> <laughs> and so we have to create it and thanks to tatum and kaylee and uh, my husband larry and alicia bishop who is the layout design for the cover and Boyd Tuttle and of course Keith Terry we were able to achieve something that we feel is very appropriate for our cover well, well now we've talked about this book and it's great looking and what's on it now we want to know what's in it but before you go there don't forget the question what's in it well, let's find out about your professional life because you know we almost got there and I thought you'd reach the end when you said well you got married and had children and okay but it sounds like there was more to it than that so Fill me in on those years. Well, I'd like to tell you as it relates to this book, how did I have such boldness as to ask Mr. Terry if I could add something to his <laughs> characterizations? Well, shrinking violets <laughs> don't usually do that. <laughs> I'm no shrinking violet, but I, and I'm, I'm no great uh, super talent or have I accomplished anything that I would consider earth shattering. Uh, my training comes from the Degrees by Independent Study program at BYU, and I will never forget sitting down at the end of that program, which I completed successfully, and had to where I had to do one more project called a closure project to complete my degree. And Ellen Allred, bless her heart, sat me down and said, Sally, let's choose a topic for your closure project. What do you know about? And I said, I know a lot about music and music education, and I know a lot about food storage because that's what I've been living for the last 20 years with my family. I've been teaching music. I've been uh, cooking for a family of, of four growing children and I've used my food storage. I, I feel like I'm an expert in those areas and that's what I'd like to do my project on. And Ellen says, I want you to take both of those things and put them in your files and don't you dare consider doing that. I want you to stretch. I want you to grow. I want you to reach down inside and find something that's in your heart to do that you've always wanted, that you've never had the time or energy or courage to do. What is it? And without more than five seconds of hesitation, I said, Ellen, I want to write a screenplay. My, my. And she said, that's your closure project. Case closed. Next. Oh, my <laughs> so goodness. So she didn't want to sit and discuss it. She wanted me to take the next two years of my life making that happen, which is what I proceeded to do. And I put it within the constraints of a closure project, which had to be written as a thesis with all of the, so it had to be written in a more scholarly fashion than a screenplay. I did not write a 120 page screenplay, but I had to study about how to do one and write a thesis on how to create a screenplay. And the focus was how to create the perfect opening scene to set up a movie, to set up an hour and a half movie. And I chose a story from a, a true story that happened, something I read in the newspaper. I called up the woman that I was intrigued by in the newspaper and interviewed her on camera and then came home with three hours of tape and proceeded to write several different opening scenes for a movie about this woman's life. And uh, that was my closure project. And I thought it was very successful and I would learned so much that when Keith Terry approached me, I was looking at his book from the perspective of someone who's very much interested in screenwriting, which is lots of action and very little dialogue, generally speaking. Okay, now you can't just leave it there. What happened <laughs> to that? Did it become uh, a full-blown uh, script uh, along the way? Uh, I have used that closure project, which ended up becoming a bound hardback book. There's a copy of it sitting in the BYU Special Collections Library. They they keep all of those you closure have to projects tell us the name. there. Is it, has well, it been the name. <laughs> well, it's it's only been published. I have a copy, and the BYU library has a copy, and I think there's one other copy in the Degrees by Independent Study uh, library. I know a guy named Boyd Tuttle that should publish this for you <laughs> on demand. You're working uh, with him. What's yes. the name of it? Well, my the book is called A Screenwriter's Journey, from oh my goodness, it's been a few years uh, from opening scene. 
uh, can't, I can't even remember the name of, the own, of my own book, but it's called A Screenwriter's Journey. It sounds like and it would be a good textbook for somebody wanting to do this. Well, it's... Is it from that standpoint? It's from that standpoint. Okay. It's how do my you take... My trip through this. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, how do you take... What are the elements that make a great opening scene? And there are... I think I discussed seven different opening scenes, the uh, ways that you could approach the same story. Um, I had to come up with a one-line synopsis of the movie. It is about a young woman who wants to assist the illegal and undocumented uh, aliens who are living across the border in Mexico to uh, come across the border or to assist them with food and, and medical supplies and that type of thing and treat them as human beings. Yeah, which is a very controversial to topic I these to days. Say, I'm going to try not to say anything, <laughs> one way or the other. Well, this woman was not <clears throat> trying to bring illegals across the border. She was trying to assist people who were stationed at the border, who had no food, no water, uh, whose children were starving and, and dying of diseases, and she was there on a humanitarian mission to assist them, not to come across the border, but to stay where they I'm are curious. and become educated where they are. I'm curious why you didn't go ahead and have this published. Well, I, it, it's not a finished screenplay, and what I've done with it since then is to create many many screenplays from that and I've entered a few screenplay competitions and, and that type of thing and, and gotten some honorable mentions. Um, the reason I've been told why filmmakers didn't pick it up and actually create the story is that I had several different locations that were a little bit, they made it a little bit too high budget. Uh, they didn't want to go to Mexico and film and the the like the LDS Film Festival, for, for example, was looking for things that could be shot in a living room or on a street in Provo or uh, But we have very enough simple. desert within five miles. We have enough desert, that's for sure. They were looking for very inexpensive things that could be done within a, a two-week time period. Okay, so. I'm going to challenge you. <laughs> Finish this thing, and you've already got people listening now that want to go and buy it and find out what happened to these people. Uh, and that's that's really what makes a book intriguing. We get involved in it, and we get acquainted with the people, and we want to know, did she succeed? Is she still living? What happened? Did she feed enough people to do any good? Was it just a altruistic feeling that she had of something she wanted to do but uh, didn't succeed? We don't know because you didn't finish the story. Well, I'm going to have to do that, <laughs> but let me tell you how that relates to Sophia. Okay. The book Sophia. This woman's name, and I can use her real name. I don't think anyone knows her. She's in Southern California. Uh, her name was Sonia Valdez, and she was associated with a group called Sonrisa, and what Sonrisa's goal was, to, it was started by a, a medical doctor who felt that these people across the border needed some type of medical care, and it's hard to go too deep into the country. He, he wanted to go once a week, and so he would he would take these medical supplies and vitamins and uh, worm medication to kill the worms that were in the children's stomachs and that kind of thing. He would take it across the border on a weekly basis uh, for as long as he lived. His name was uh, Dr. Tomayo, uh, I can't remember his name, but he he would take it across and, and uh, Sonia worked as a nurse in his office and she learned to, to assist these people as well and, and she was an abused young woman in her home and had um, had learned to find meaning and purpose in her life and to find courage uh, from from going and helping those less fortunate and she uh, related to these people and she took out of her own nurse's salary um, she bought medications and vitamins and that type of thing for uh, this this these people and and took them across and after the the Japanese doctor had passed away she continued his work uh, with Sonrisa. Now this relates to the story of Sophia because I could see a similar heroine in Sophia as my character Sonia mm -hmm. back then and I think I um, told Keith a few elements that I had learned from this real woman Sonia Valdez and we put a few little things about that I'd learned about her in my screenwriter's journey into uh, Sophia's life. Okay, and if somebody wants this, we now know where to get it. You want to read that? <laughs> well, okay, my book is called 
<laughs> a screenwriter's journey from story selection through the opening scene. And it can be found at the BYU Special Collections Library, um, 378.23, J636, 2004, Harold B. Lee Library. There you go. So it can be found there, I suppose. And then in the Degrees by Independent Study, or I, I believe it's called uh, Bachelor of General Studies now. The program that I was in no longer exists, but uh, it's a wonderful program. allows people to get their degree from BYU if they left there uh, without to get finishing. get it finished up. Yeah, that's great. All right, now, so you've introduced us to her background, Sophia's background. You've changed the name a little bit. This, well, this, this Sophia is Keith's Did he character. already have that name? Oh, yes. Keith, and Keith you just had Sophia to be with full a woman, blonde. Uh, mm -hmm. that, with a similar name, for mm -hmm. goodness sakes. So, all right. Now, you've told us a little bit. She's Catholic, and uh, she wanted to become a nun, maybe? And uh, why is she compelling to us as the reader? I think she'll be very compelling to LDS readers and Catholic readers because she is almost uh, too good to be true and she's she's a girl that does everything in in a way that is the right way she her heart is right her mind is right her strength is is to do the right thing for the right reasons and to love her family and to love God and to truly serve him and I think as such she's a good example to us of what each of us should want to do and what every good story does is takes a truly remarkable hero or heroine and pits them against larger than life obstacles and tests them and tries them in the crucible of affliction and I think you will see how Sophia comes through this uh, she she comes through not always perfect but always with something learned and something gained and an increase in courage and an increase in desire to do the very best thing or the thing that God would have her do and I think that that's something that all of us need to to see somebody struggle and overcome I think it gives us hope for our own our own challenges. Historically speaking what time period is this? The book takes place during the First World War Okay. and a number of the conflicts that Sophia encounters are due to the the overwhelming magnitude of the Great War, or the war to end all wars. And, it, and, and we're talking in Europe? She it travels from the Ukraine to Vienna and spends some time in Vienna at the military hospital treating some of the soldiers there. And that's where she learns about, uh, by working with some of the famous doctors in some of the, the some of the best hospitals in the world were in Vienna at that she time something about in medicine. Austria. Yeah. She learned a lot about medicine by assisting the doctors there as a young teenage girl, just as a Catholic girl that was serving God by being where she was assigned to to be, which was in the hospital. And then her family, because of the Russian Revolution taking place at the same time, her family in the Ukraine was uh, escaping from the, the disastrous consequences of that Bolshevik Revolution and the, and the, the turmoil that was occurring in Russia. And so do, does he actually take us as the author? Does he take us through all of these scenes? Um, because she is there, I mean, we're aware of them, but is she in the middle of any of the conflict going on itself? Uh, no, not directly. Uh, the book, in the first chapter, uh, it, it just gives an overview that the reason that she is coming from the Ukraine to Vienna is to serve the, the church, the Catholic Church, and then uh, because her family in the Ukraine wants to escape and emigrate from uh, the Ukraine into Austria where they have family members, Sophia goes back to the Ukraine and picks up her family and serves as an interpreter because she speaks both Ukrainian and Austrian and or German. Austrian German and uh, so she goes back to meet with them and to help them emigrate and then come back to uh, and to take them and drop them off in Vienna and that all happens in the space of just a couple or three pages in the first chapter so it sets the stage and then the adventure starts because uh, in chapter two it talks about something that happens that's quite exciting on that train ride with her family 
from the Ukraine to Vienna. Let me tell you who I'm talking to again. We're so happy that she's here with us today and got through a really nightmare trying to come down University Avenue and along the way. Uh, Sally Johnson, we're so pleased to have her, and she's representing Keith Terry. Uh, she is his consultant and working with him, shall I say, advertising and publicity, and uh, as well as uh, an editor for him. And uh, he's down, as I recall, in New Mexico. Is that he where he moved to Albuquerque, Albuquerque? Not too very long ago. He lived in Laguna Niguel in Southern California. Right, that's uh, about the time when I knew him. He mm -hmm. was in that area. And so he has family in Albuquerque and uh, relocated there and just loves it there and would want to say hello to all of you it wonderful listeners. It is probably 71 degrees and, and no snow <laughs> anticipated whatsoever. <laughs> so. He tells me how much he loves Albuquerque frequently. Yeah, nice and warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he serves in the temple there two days Does a week he? with oh. his wife, Anne. Yeah, she's great. They're both just a wonderful family. Well, I'm excited to read the book. Do I get one of these if I ask you on the air? Can I embarrass you enough to keep <laughs> one of them? <laughs> I'm sure that Keith would want you to have one, and Boyd Tuttle as well. Well, and, I, and Boyd brought a whole lot of books with him, and he's coming back on the 25th and uh, tell us about some more new authors that, in fact, most of the people I've had on are authors that he represents and has published their works for them. So we're excited to have more books coming in particularly coming through the holidays. The holidays. It's 49 and cloudy. Where? Where is it? Probably right here in cloudy. Provo. Oh, in, in Albuquerque? Albuquerque? Oh. Okay, well, all right. It's, Maybe it's nicer weather here I, than in Albuquerque. I know. Yesterday and today when I got up to go swimming around 7, 38 o'clock, it was uh, 29 degrees, and I think, what in the world am I doing? So I wanted to roll over and go back to bed, but I'm committed mm -hmm. <laughs> to swim every day. Okay. Well, you'd asked me about the, the First World War. I think it's important to mention that because Well, of that's the, why the I asked, war. was she involved in it? Mm -hmm. Because um, th that's a whole different story. And if it's, is it historically correct, or have we just taken a lot of, has he taken a lot of liberties, or is he really, these things happen, and she happens to be a character that is part of them, fictional Well, character. everything that happens in the book could have happened. It's it's very realistic. Um, however, there are some liberties taken with with respect to the prophet Joseph F. Smith. Uh, I believe the book has him in what was called the Sandwich Islands in during his mission there. Um, or I believe it it has him in Hawaii at a certain point of time when he may really not have been there that exact year. But it's it's just easier for the sake of the story to have him be in Hawaii at a certain year that was within a few years of when he was actually there. There are no, um, it, it won't be historically correct as far as all of the dates are concerned, but all of the things really did occur. The incidences. The incidents yeah. all occurred, but just for the flow of the story, it, it was easy to it, tweak it, the years a bit. You know, more and more they're doing this. I had uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sherman Fleek who is also with um, Boyd Tuttle. Uh, he was here uh, talking about his uh, books on Mormon Battalion. And uh, his, they're fascinating because he's brought all of the Mormon Battalion, what they did and did not do, to life with by using characters that are fictional characters, but they're mixed in with historical characters. And more and more we see that because it makes it more compelling. Very few of us want to sit down. Well, I don't know. Maybe there are a lot of you out there, but I'm not compelled to sit down and read a history book just to find out the history. You do it, give a review on it, and I'll listen to it. But I enjoy the characters. I enjoy uh, relating to them and feeling their feelings, and that's what, key, that's what becomes compelling, I think. Not just historical fact for most of us. That's a little on the light side, I guess. <laughs> huh? you know. yeah. but, uh, but it's faster reading, too. And uh, you remember them, and that's why they get made into movies, because they're compelling. And well, the Savior used stories to teach. He told the parables. story of the all, all and parables. Yep. He used the Good Samaritan and the story of the lost coin. And he taught people in stories because we love stories. We love to hear about people that could be us, maybe uh, they or or that we can learn from from. And I think that that by the fact that the Savior used stories, that we can follow his example and create stories that might be archetypal stories, things that could have been true or might be 
re might represent us in one form or another, but maybe the names have changed or maybe the dates are a little bit different, but um, the feelings of the heart and the, the behavior and the reaction and action um, under pressure, I think are things that we can learn from with, through a fictional story. I'm talking to Sally Johnson. She's representing Keith Terry today in this wonderful new, but well, it's been out a little while because it's, it's just, I mean, people talking about it everywhere and carrying one under their arms. Now, you can get this in a paperback. This happens to be a hard copy we have here that sells for around $22. I'm sure the paperbacks are a little bit less than that. But yes. they're beautiful paperbacks. It's not, it's not the kind you pick up for a quick read on a weekend. They're beautiful paperbacks. The paper is excellent paper and beautifully, beautifully put together. So we're going to recommend this book. Uh, go to your bookstore and uh, find it there. Find it uh, LDS, any LDS bookstore, and on Amazon also. And I um, want to thank the Kayani people for always being behind me and uh, being our sponsors. And next week, I do want to announce that uh, the oldest of the Osmond children, Burl Osmond, is starting his own show. He has been on the air with me. He was on yesterday. We were celebrating his uh, coming of his own show. Uh, he is, has supported his siblings for many, many years. Verl and his brother Tom were born deaf, and uh, Verl has now had implants, and he can actually hear the dog walking on the floor. And uh, he hears very well, and he's taking on his first big project, is producing his own show here on utahvalleylive.com and also on KHQN. 14.80 a.m. So he's going to start Monday, 9 a.m., 9 o'clock a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, we have now Joy Bischoff on from 5 to 6 on radio. She's not streaming at this time, but she is on the radio at, on 14.80 a.m. from 5 to 6, and that's Understanding Nibley. And starting December 1st, we'll have Monica um, Barber, and she's going to be bringing on super personalities and people around the valley that are really interesting. And of course, I will continue my show at noon every day. So they're coming on every day, and they'll each have guests. So it's really going to, it's getting more and more fun. We're going to have more fun with this. Now, you have, I've pursued some of my dreams over the years, and in fact, actually, we have been able to do most of them just, um, you know, by putting one foot in front of the other and pushing. And, uh, <laughs> What has kept you going with your dreams? And have you filled all up? I mean, you're still a young gal yet. What are you going to do with your life? I have an exciting career. I am currently a booking agent. I've started my own agency called Greenlight Booking. And because of the word booking, I felt like it wasn't too far of a stretch to work with Keith Terry and his books. Uh, my The predominant uh, part of my of my um, clientele are people that are looking for music, uh, live music and dance and I have a number of, of wonderful artists that are on my website. You can go to greenlightbooking.com and Let's see. Let's say that a couple of times uh, to make sure get people can have time to write it down. Green light, L-I-G-H-T? Yes, greenlightbooking.com Okay. And you can see some of the wonderful artists that I represent. Uh, most of them live right here in uh, Utah and I'm sending them or trying to send them all over the world to show that Utah has Utah has more talent than any other state in the Union so it's, that's my career and <laughs> that's a pretty good career so uh, if people want to get hold of you do they have to go to your website or can you give out a phone number that they can get hold of you yeah you're welcome to call me 801-471-3750 and, and you live here in Utah Valley, right? I live in Utah, Utah County. Yeah. So. And uh, let's do that again. 801-471-3779? Correct. Okay. And 471-3779 to get hold of you. You represent yeah. all kinds of artists. Would I say that would that be correct? Yes. Uh, how about actors? No? Nope. I, Liz, I Liz Knight is covering that pretty right. good. Right. Knight She's Star got, Agency is wonderful. Yeah. There's a number of, of wonderful agencies in the Valley. I've worked with TMG, TMG and Vicki Panic, and McCarty and Susie McCarty Agency. I've worked with Broadway and Sheila, Sheila Erickson and Night Star and Tony and Liz Knight. And I've had wonderful experiences with all of them. We have a number of fine 
film uh, film agencies and mo film and modeling agencies here. We're, we're going to be getting those. into that. We've got some people coming on that will represent what's going on here. And I know when I was at the BYU Motion Picture Studio, uh, I was not aware till I get, came into that scene some years ago, almost 30 years ago now, we have a lot of films being made all over the state of Utah, an amazing number of films. People come here. Well, of course, it's good. They bring a lot of um, people into and it pumps up the economy wherever they land. And I think that this book Is would this make, be a movie? This book would make a wonderful movie. It has everything that a great movie should have. It has action. It has adventure. It has characters that are larger than life. It has a definite uh, plot and, and moral and uh, without being terribly preachy, uh, it, it has everything that a really good movie does. There's, there's a feeling at the end that I think is unmistakable. And I think something I failed to mention earlier is that this is a book for all ages. Sophia is a book that my mother read, who is, well, you can guess my mother's age. Uh, it's a book <laughs> that my, telling. <laughs> I won't say my mother's age, but she's a wonderful woman in, in her golden years. And um, then I have a grandmother who is still alive, who also read the book and loved it. My Could mother, a teenager read it and enjoy it? And well, my 23 year old daughter read it and she absolutely loved it and read it twice and referred all of her friends to it. So if you can get a college student that loves it and uh, someone my, and my age, I'm the baby boomer age that, that really enjoyed it, my mother's age, the seniors, and then the super seniors and my grandmother's age group. Super seniors, now that's yeah. a lovely way to put I it. I just coined that term maybe. <laughs> super senior. <laughs> it's a book for everybody and uh, I, I think that everybody will enjoy it. Several men have read it as well and have really enjoyed it. And uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we have people that type all kinds of things into our chat room. This says Pat, super duper senior, whatever. <laughs> but Pat, what you need to know about this book, I think in the few minutes we have left, is that this is a book What is that, the message? Yeah, what yeah, is the message? It's really important to say that this is a book that was taken from the private unpublished journals of the prophet Joseph F. Smith. He had oh. a very interesting life. His father Hiram was martyred with the prophet Joseph. And as a very young boy, I think he was only five years old, he he's had that tragedy. And when he was um, a teenager, just I believe 13 years old, 14, his mother Mary Fielding Smith passed away. And this boy was set adrift, basically. He he was just lost. And, and some of the things that happened in his life, I think would shock some of the readers and he has detailed those things in his journals and they have been hidden from the public for a, a number of years. Do they come out in this book? And in this book Keith Terry was allowed by one of the family members to read those journals and to take some of those things that have been kept from the public and he's he's detailed them in a very sensitive way and shows some very shocking details about a man that became a prophet and yet I felt that reading those things about the prophet made him human to me, made him real, and the important thing is it gave me hope that with all of my mistakes and all of my trials and all of the things I've done wrong in my life, if a prophet has done a few things maybe not so stellar, there's hope for me and there's hope for people that have, have made mistakes. And I think that's the overriding message of Sophia. Never give up. Never there give up. There is always hope. Well, we certainly appreciate your, your being here. And a shout out to Keith Terry. We hope you're watching. And uh, certainly she has done you justice today with your book, Keith. And Sally, thank you. You've made this come alive for us. And uh, I'm going to keep a copy here. So uh, I'll give a report on this later on because it really sounds like something that everyone should have. What a great gift, particularly during the holidays. So. Thanks for coming. Will you come again? Oh, I'd love to. Okay, good. And give us an update on your life and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Pete Hansen and Kent Vorkink. Uh, UtahValleyLive.com is their company. Sheranian Communication and Broadcasting is my part of the company. And we are here on KHQN 1480 and pat.utahvalleylive.com. We'll be back on Monday. Remember to watch Viral Osmond early in the morning. Have a great weekend. <laughs>